Pastor Kelvin, uh, I am grateful for the opportunity to open God's Word with you today, and I'd encourage you to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. Aren't you glad that God has a heart for all nations? Because we would not be gathered here today at this moment if God did not have a heart for the nations. I'm a follower of Jesus, and I have a hope of eternal life because God has a heart for all all the nations of the world. In fact, that is the story of the Bible. As you open up the scriptures, it begins with Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, and where God says to Abram, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to all the families of the earth. David then picks up this theme in Psalm chapter 96, where he says, declare his glory among all nations. His marvelous works among all peoples. In fact, there are over 1,700 verses all throughout the Scripture that carry the story from the beginning to the end that expresses God's heart for all the peoples and all the nations of the world. So that when you get to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, we see John as he's looking for the lion of the tribe of Judah. And what does he say? See, he sees a lamb whose blood was shed as a ransom for people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people group. And that is you and that is me. And just two chapters later, in chapter 7 and verse 9, we see that there are people from every tribe, tongue, and nation gathered around the throne, singing and worshiping, holy and great is the Lord our God. The mission task is and will be successful. And we have the opportunity to be a part of it. In fact, all followers and believers in Jesus Christ are are invited to be a part of what God is doing in the world. His, His global redemptive purposes for all peoples. And that's why Jesus five times would give the Great Commission. Each of the Gospels concludes with a Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples. In Acts chapter 1, of course, it's another Great Commission passage. I'd like to share with you one of the greatest joys and greatest challenges that we as followers of Jesus Christ can experience, and that is engaging in God's global purposes. It is a great joy. It is an incredible privilege that we can be a part of something that is far greater than our short lives here on earth. God does have a love for the nations, and he sends his servants, men like Daniel, one of the greatest missionaries recorded for us in Scripture. And so you can open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6 if you'd like to to follow along here this afternoon. Daniel was not a missionary that went voluntarily. Daniel was a slave. Daniel was taken in chains to a people and a culture not his own. But Daniel was not a man who was bitter. Daniel was not a man who murmured. Daniel was not a man who held on to his rights. Daniel was a man who, in spite of his circumstances, oriented his life around God's purposes. So I'd like to share this story with you as we, as we kind of walk through this chapter. And as we do, I want to bring to your memory a passage from Acts chapter 17. You remember Paul is arguing there uh, and teaching about the unknown God. And in verse 26, he, he says, you know, all the peoples of the world, where they live and when they live there, has been determined by God so that they might seek him and find him. Acts 17, 26, and 27. 
a massive truth that, to help us understanding what's going on here in Babylon and, and Persia and uh, in, in the life of Darius and in the life of this kingdom. And so let's take a look here at this story. So we pick it up. This is kind of the middle of the book. It's in the middle of the narrative. Darius is now the king, and he is establishing his government. And so he appoints 120 governors or satraps over the kingdom in verse 1. He stations them throughout the realm and over them three administrators, one of them being this man Daniel, this Jewish slave Daniel. So you have Darius at the top, and then you have these three Mm, you could call them vice kings or vice presidents. And underneath them, 120 of these governors that are, that are spread throughout the, the kingdom. And these satraps would be accountable to the three so that the king would not be defrauded. He wouldn't be cheated. Daniel distinguished himself above the administrators and the satraps. In other words, of, of the three and of the 120, Daniel was the king's top choice, the one he most trusted. Because, the scriptures say, verse 3, he had an excellent spirit. He had an excellent spirit. Or maybe your version in English says extraordinary. There was something unique about Daniel. There was something special about him. There was something that distinguished him apart from all of the other employees of the king. Why? I want to answer this question and then show you how it has an impact on the world around him. Why? Why does Daniel have this excellent or extraordinary spirit? In fact, it was so significant, scriptures say at the end of verse 3, the king planned to set him over the whole realm. God has his man right where he needs him. But so does the enemy. And now the powers of darkness are being mobilized against God's champion of light. Jealousy and and greed and hatred rise up in the hearts of these other administrators and satraps and they keep trying to find a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom, verse 4, but they could find no charge of corruption, they could find nothing that they could accuse him of, for he was trustworthy. And here's, I want to give you my first point. Daniel was uncompromisingly faithful in the work that God had prepared for him. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, with good works that have been prepared beforehand that we, as we follow him, should walk in them. Daniel's work, designed by God, was to be a slave in a foreign land for the sake of God's glory among the nations. And Daniel was uncompromisingly faithful in the work that he was called to do. In fact, if you flip over a couple of pages to Daniel chapter 11 and verse 1, you'll read that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would serve the king. He would stand up and strengthen the king. He was going to serve the king so that Darius would be successful. Think about that for just a moment. A Jewish slave serving a pagan king, purposing to make him successful. And David, or Daniel was absolutely faithful in what he was called to do. Paul would write this to the church in Philippi, do everything, do everything without murmuring, without grumbling, without arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure in the midst of a perverse Distorted generation, as children of God, you shine as lights in the world. And you have the right then to hold forth the word of life. Let me ask you for a moment. As you go to your workplace on Monday morning, 
as you go to the classroom, to school, to the factory, to the office, to the store, wherever your life takes you in the coming days, is, can you say this of yourself? Have you been uncompromisingly faithful in the work that God has called you? There is no one that can point a finger at you and say, you have defrauded your employer. You have cheated. Daniel, you couldn't do that. He was uncompromisingly faithful in the work that God called him to do. This frustrated his enemies. This frustrated the, the administrators. So they began to look for another way that they could accuse Daniel, but they found that he was uncompromisingly obedient to the commandments of God. Verse 4, the administrators and satraps there kept trying to find a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom. They, they could find no charge or corruption, for he was trustworthy. No negligence or corruption was found in him. Then these men said, verse 5, we will never find any charge against this Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of God. But here again, they were stumped. Remember in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. He loved his God. Something happened early in his life as he sat on his mother's knee, as he paced the palace there in Jerusalem, as, as he learned the law of God in, in school, and something about the wonder and the beauty and the glory and the majesty and the, the, the reality of God captured his heart. And he never let it go. He held on to the truth of who God was, and, and as he was expressed in the commands the law that was recorded. And he remembered the writings of, of David and men that had come before him. He was uncompromisingly faithful in his obedience to God. In verse 6, the administrators and the satraps, they went to the king. And so they, they plan and they plot and they put together this grand scheme in order to trick and to trap Daniel. And they say, oh, may King Darius, may you live forever. And they butter him up and they flatter him. And all the administrators of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps and the advisors and the governors have agreed, O oh, king, that you should establish an ordinance and enforce an edict for 30 days. Anyone who petitions any god or man except you, O oh, king, should be thrown to the lion's den. Therefore, your majesty established the edict and signed the document so that as a law, the Medes and Persians, it's irrevocable. It cannot be changed. Oh, and Darius, he's hearing this and saying, wow, oh, how my people love me. Oh, they want to worship me. Oh, they just, they see me as the greatest king. And he's flattered and he's feeling pretty good about this. And so he signs the edict. Verse 10, when Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house. The windows in its upper room were opened. The windows were, were opened. There was no hiding. It was, he was opened eastward toward Jerusalem where he knew the temple was, where he knew where God had been dwelling. And, and he, he prayed there three times a day. He got down on his knees and he prayed and he gave thanks to God just as he had done before. You see, Daniel was uncompromisingly faithful to his quiet time, to his relationship with God. There was no edict, there was no law, there was no agenda, there was nothing on his schedule that was going to keep him from his God. David writes in Psalm chapter 27 and verse 1, this one thing have I desired, this is my priority. There is nothing else to behold the beauty of of God, to dwell in his temple, to inquire of him, to just be with my God. Maybe that's what had kind of gone through Daniel's mind and he said, there's nothing, nothing's going to change my commitment to being in my quiet place with my God. I wonder if this could be said of you. 
Perhaps for you, it's sleep. It's a busy schedule. Uh, there's a myriad of things that occur and happen within our lives that, that keep us from that intimate, close, walking with Jesus kind of relationship. Not for Daniel. He was uncompromisingly faithful to his quiet time. Nothing would change that. He hears the edict, and, and, and the first reaction is to go and to be alone with his God, to get down on his knees and to pray. It's, it's interesting, we don't have any idea what Daniel actually prayed. But I'm sure that had something to do with his immediate future. He knew what the law said. He knew the edict. He knew the consequences But it is interesting, when the Holy Spirit inspired this word, he included this phrase, he gave thanks. How about that? In the midst of knowing his life was about to end, he got down on his knees before his God in a foreign country, in a foreign land, in a foreign culture, with foreign food, and knowing he's about to be fed to the lions, he gives thanks to his God. How are the affections of your heart today? When you think about the loves and the priorities, what consumes your thoughts and your mind and your, your time and your agenda. Does it have anything to do with God outside of your Saturday or Sunday service? For Daniel, God was everything. God was it. God and His global purposes. God and honoring Him. God and making him great. That was Daniel's priority. And because it was, in spite of the headwinds of persecution that were about to come against him, he was on his knees, open towards the window in, in Jerusalem, and he was giving thanks to his God. Daniel was uncompromisingly faithful in his quiet time before the Lord. Well, of course, he's seen. The governors had their spies out. They had their telescopes and their binoculars, and they could see Daniel. These men, they went as a group in verse 11, and they found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God. So they approached the king, and they asked about his edict, Oh, king, you can just hear the, the fakeness kind of coming out of these men, politicians. Oh, king, didn't you sign? I, I seem to remember, maybe, did you sign this edict? Had something to do with people only worshiping you? I, you know, and they come to this king and... It, and if they don't, they'll be, they'll be thrown to the lions. And the king answered, well, yes, of course, you know, you're the one who brought it to me as the law of the Medes and Persians. The order stands, it's irrevocable, it can't be changed. Verse 13, they replied to the king, Daniel. I think at that moment when they said Daniel's name, the, the, the blood in the king Darius's face, I think it probably drained out. He just went pale, and all of a sudden, he knew what these men were up to. He knew. He saw right through the trap. Daniel, one of the Judean exiles, he, he's ignored you, the king, and the edict that you signed, for he prays three times a day, just as he did before. And now the stage is set. 
The drama of an epic night is about to unfold. (laughs) We sang a moment ago that God never leaves us nor forsakes us. I would suggest to you that God designed this moment specifically and intentionally and sovereignly for Daniel, for the purpose of making himself known among the nations. He had his faithful servant right where he wanted him to be. And Satan, of course, he'd mobilized his governors and his powers of darkness, and now we have 120 against one, and we have King Darius in the middle. The king who who loved his servant Daniel, who could trust his servant Daniel, who had entrusted to him the kingdom, had given to him the keys to the kingdom. And verse 14 reads, as soon as the king heard this, he was very displeased. Initially, he thought, well, all of my governors, why they love me, they want the kingdoms to just worship me, to see me for who I really am, to put me on Instagram and Facebook and to tweet out my greatness. And and wow, that's going to be fantastic. I am, after all, a great king. So for 30 days, I get to be the headlines. And now he sees that wasn't it at all. It wasn't for the king's sake that they wanted this edict. It was so they could destroy Daniel. So he's displeased, and he sets his mind on rescuing Daniel, and he makes every effort until the sun goes down. He is trying, he's striving, he's he's struggling to find a way to get Daniel released from the consequences of disobeying the edict. The sun sets, and the men come to the king again in verse 15, and they say to him, you as king know it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no edict or ordinance the king establishes, it can't be changed. You need to send Daniel to the den of lions. So the king gives the order. And they brought Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den. And I want you to see what the king says because God is at work. Through Through a slave, through an employee to just an average person who's doing his work that had been assigned to him, God is working. And I want you to see it in the language that King Darius says. He says to Daniel, may your God, may your God, whom you serve continually, I've watched it, I've watched your life, I've seen it, I love the verse that you have posted up here at the front of the auditorium, Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others. That is Daniel. Why? So that they may see your good deeds. And what is the result? They would glorify your Father in heaven, Matthew chapter 5. It's exactly the life that Daniel is living. And Darius had witnessed the life and the testimony of a faithful servant who would not compromise. He says, may your God, whom you serve with uncompromising faithfulness, may he rescue you. And he called for the stone, and he places his seal. And Daniel is left in absolute darkness with nothing but the padding paws of ravenous lions walking around him. Verse 18, the king returns to his palace. He walks to his bedroom. He slams the door. The palace staff are are murmuring and they're trying to figure out what is going on and, and what does the king need. And the king says, I want no food. I want no music. The court jester is left in his room. I don't want any women brought in. I am to be alone. And all night long, Darius is pacing back and forth, back and forth. I can't, I don't know what's going through his mind, but I would imagine it's something like, could the God of Daniel 
I know my gods couldn't do this, but could the God of Daniel, is he strong enough? Huh. Daniel served him so faithfully. Could, could Daniel's God save him from the mouths of the lions? Could, is it possible that Daniel's God is greater than any other God? Finally, the first light of dawn begins to glow on the eastern horizon and the, the king gets up and he wraps his, his evening gown around him and as fast as his 65-year-old legs would take him, he races to the lion's den. The, the scriptures say he hurried, he, he ran to the lion's den and he reaches the den and he cries out in anguish. He says, Daniel, Daniel, are you there? Servant of the living God. Something happened in the middle of the night as he was reflecting on Daniel's life and what Daniel had told him. He goes from your God, Daniel, who you serve, to he is the living God. You see this, this shift in faith that's going on in Darius' mind. Servant of the living God, the king says, has your God whom you serve continually, has he been able to rescue you? Is it possible that your God is strong enough to rescue you from that which would destroy you forever? And Daniel spoke with the king and he said, O oh, king, and he gives this Jewish blessing. It's like the gospel in Jewish language. May you live forever. In other words, I want you to know my God so that you don't experience death. May you live forever. O oh, king, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. They haven't hurt me for I was found innocent before him. Also, I have not committed a crime against you, my king. And the king, he is overjoyed and he gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den uninjured. And here's my last point. See, Daniel was unwavering and uncompromising in his quiet time and in his faith in God. We're often like Peter when Jesus calls him out of the boat and we begin to look at the waves and the storm and everything that's swirling around our life. And our faith begins to waver and it begins to fluctuate and, and suddenly fear begins to creep into our hearts and our minds, but we lose sight of God. We can lose sight of His purposes. But Daniel was unwavering in his faith and his trust in God. Daniel was pulled out of that den of lions, <clears throat> safe secure, unharmed. The 120 that accused Daniel are thrown in along with their families, and before they even hit the ground, the lions have destroyed them. Look at what happens. Then King Darius wrote to those of every people, of every nation, of every language. <laughs> Do you see what has happened here in a matter of mere hours? God has put himself and his goodness and his greatness on display for the entire world to see. And now we have a pagan king who believes with all of his heart in the reality of Daniel's God, because Daniel was a faithful witness, and he let his light shine. And now Darius, this king, writes a letter to every people everywhere, and he says, may your prosperity abound. I issue a decree that in all my royal dominion, people must tremble. People must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. Why? Why? No one ever feared or trembled before the other gods. Why this one? Well, 
For he is the living God. He is the one who endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his dominion has no end. He is the one who rescues. He is the one who delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth for he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions and from around every campfire and every well where the women were drawing the water and wherever they were baking their breads, the legends were told and the tales were whispered of what God did for Daniel. Daniel, who had served him so faithfully, and the kingdoms of the world were shaken and stirred for the glory of God. Why? Because in Daniel there was an excellent spirit. And there was an excellent spirit in Daniel because he was uncompromisingly faithful in his work in his love and obedience for his God. He was uncompromisingly faithful in his quiet time and being with his God. He was unwavering in his faith in spite of what was going on around him. And God was glorified. And the nations knelt before God. And the prophet himself prospered. Verse 28, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You know how Daniel ends. The book of Daniel ends with this verse, chapter 12, and verse 3. Those who are wise, not wise in the eyes of the world, but those who are wise from God's perspective, just like in Philippians chapter 2, will shine like the stars, the brightness of the heaven above. And those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. One man, one man, just one, staggered the kingdoms. One man changed the life of a king through his faithfulness. What could God do with a church like this one? where its family members were uncompromisingly faithful to the work that God prepared beforehand that you should walk in it. If you were uncompromisingly faithful to your love and obedience to God, if you were uncompromisingly faithful to your quiet time with God, if you were unwavering in your faith in God so that your life would shine, in the workplace, in your community, in your neighborhood, among the nations. Malaysia has yet to see what God can do with a church that is committed and uncompromisingly faithful to His command to go into all the world and make disciples. Will you be that church. Daniel loved his God. Daniel loved God's purposes. And God used this slave in a foreign land to shake kingdoms for his glory. Father in heaven, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask that you would send your spirit among the hearts and the lives, minds of men and women in this room, the boys and the girls, the young people, 
Lord, may these men and women give themselves for the purpose of your glory, that they would in no wise compromise, that their lights would shine as the brightness and the stars of heaven, that they would walk in wisdom in a way that honors and glorifies you. I want to ask if you would stand to your feet and I think the pastors traditionally will come here to the front and I want to invite you to maybe kneel and pray. I want to invite you to come forward. Uh, This may be the first time that you've really heard of a God, the Christian God, the God of the Bible who is great enough, who is big enough that he can shut the mouths of ravenous, hungry lions. You say, I want to know that God some more. I need somebody to introduce him to me. Maybe that's you today. Would you, would you come and would you speak with one of the pastors here? Say, tell me, tell me about this God. Would you tell me about this God who is so great? It could be that you're here today as a follower of Jesus and you know You know in your heart that God desires to use you in some way to make him great among the nations. Perhaps you look at your life and you say, I've failed. I've compromised. I'm not living the way I need to live so that God can use me. And I've seen from Daniel chapter 6 where I've fallen short and I need to repent. Maybe you need to come forward and speak with one of your pastors. Or maybe you need to just kneel where you are and just pray before the Lord. I want to just invite you to respond however the Holy Spirit is leading you. Father, as you do your work in the hearts of men and women, as they speak to their pastors, as they pray before you. Lord, I pray that you would stir in us a hunger and a desire to live a life that is crucified in the flesh, but alive with the wonder and the glory of who Jesus Christ is, a ransom for sinners. And we have the privilege and the honor of communicating and holding forth the word of life. Lord, I pray that you'd help all of us to see the wonder and the glory, that the privilege that you have given to us to be a part of what you are doing for all of eternity. I pray that you would help us to not allow any compromise. That you would help us to be faithful. God glorifying. Christ-centered, gospel-speaking witnesses and ambassadors for you. I pray this in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus Christ and for his sake and his glory among the nations. Amen.